Welcome to the first seminar of winter quarter. Our guest today, our lecturer, is uh, a professor of history at um, CSU in, in Chico. Uh, professor Charles Geschechter is a historian in Africa. Uh, he took his master's degree at Howard University, the oldest uh, uh, traditionally black college in the United States. And then he got his PhD at UCLA. The focus of his research in Africa has been Somalia. He has made 20 research trips to Africa, written books, many articles, done teaching in Africa. And it was, in fact, in the backwoods of Somalia that he became interested in the problem of HIV and AIDS. Um, reading in the popular press and, and uh, hearing the television and the radio and so on, he noticed that given the definition of AIDS in Africa, he became an AIDS patient every time he went out into the backwoods of Somalia. And then after he flew back home to Chico, uh, he recovered. And this happened over and over. Um, and so he began then to read, look into the medical literature, and so on. And his lecture today has grown out of that experience, and also his experience with the research that he's done in Africa. Because, as well, what he sees on the ground there doesn't really match up very well with what he reads in the popular press here. So I present to you then Professor Charles Michel. Uh, thanks very much. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Lovely part of California. Um, happy to get away from the valley as well in uh, Chico. Um, th this is, uh, as I understand it, the, uh, the opening talk for a series uh, during the winter quarter on uh, different aspects and questions about uh, this thing called AIDS. And I thought what I would try to do would be to maybe make some broad and general remarks for about 30 minutes or so, and then leave the rest of the time for any, of, any, any questions or um, inquiries that you may, that you may have. Um, I want to start with a legend. <clears throat> uh, the legend uh, has it that uh, one day a man was walking uh, in the desert, and he encountered fear and plague. And uh, fear and plague told the man that they were on the way to a city where they were going to kill 10,000 people. And so the man asked Plague if uh, he was going to do all the work. And Plague just smiled and said, no, I'll take care of just a few hundred. I'll let my friend Fear do all the rest. Now, another quote that I'm particularly fond of as an introduction here is from the great American educator Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, someone once asked North Whitehead, uh, Professor Whitehead, what's more important to you, facts or theories? And Whitehead thought about that for a while, and he said, it's the theories about the facts. And that's what I'm all about here, really, is examining more closely and maybe more skeptically and carefully what is it that is making Africans sick these days? What is making Africans ill, and how do we know? And what can we do to restore them uh, to health? Now. One of the things I also do in Africa is gather statistics. And my field work in Somalia back in the 70s and 80s uh, taught me very clearly how difficult it was to gather good numbers, good verifiable statistics that you could share and you could put on the table, as we say in statistics. Put your numbers on the table and let's be able to verify them. And I wondered where some of these numbers about AIDS cases or HIV prevalence in Africa actually came from. And the closer I looked, the more appalled I became at the uh, funny business involved in the gathering of the statistics. First of all, you need to understand what is considered an AIDS case in Africa. An AIDS case in Africa is defined decisively differently than an AIDS case in North America or Australia, or Europe. I'm not a medical historian, but I'm unaware of a disease which is defined one way on one continent and defined another way on another continent. You can't have lung cancer, for example, in, in St. Helena, get on a plane and fly to London and be told you don't have lung cancer, or pregnancy, or malaria, or tuberculosis, or stroke. But with AIDS, yes. There is one definition that works in Napa County and another definition that works in Somalia. 
The definition of an AIDS case in Africa involves what's known as clinical symptoms. Symptoms. And there are four clinical symptoms that are officially defined as an AIDS case in Africa. The patient must have a persistent dry cough. The patient must have a high fever. The patient must have suffered from diarrhea for uh, about 14 days. And the patient must have lost 10% of his or her body weight in the past two months. If you have those symptoms and you are an African, you have AIDS. That's the official World Health Organization definition of AIDS in Africa according to the Bangui definition of 1985. I've had all those symptoms, had them on numerous occasions working in Somalia, but as Professor Agard pointed out, I get on a plane and I fly from Africa to California and I get over AIDS, so to speak. So my first point here is to understand that when we look at AIDS in Africa, and you look at statistics about AIDS cases in Africa, do not assume that these statistics are numbers that are like rocks that you just simply go and you pick up off the ground and you count them. Statistics are not like natural phenomenon. Statistics are created by someone. They are a social phenomenon. You must ask always, how was this statistic gathered? What was being defined? How was it gathered? Why was it gathered? And when you do that, you may find yourself asking some very tricky but very elementary questions about these astonishing numbers that usually open and close any article about AIDS in Africa. What's being measured, in other words? In that regard, keep in mind this. Very often, the term AIDS, which means an acquired immune deficiency syndrome, it's a syndrome, it's a collection of symptoms. AIDS is often run together and made into a manufactured single word with HIV, which is this uh, human immunodeficiency virus. One is a virus, one is a syndrome. You must, from the very outset, break the two apart because the collection of AIDS numbers and the collection of HIV statistics are dramatically different. Generally in Africa, HIV statistics are gathered from one source and one source alone, particularly in South Africa, a, a, a situation I know very well, having served as an advisor to the president of the country. HIV numbers, which test the antibodies to this virus, are gathered in one place and one place alone, and that is at antenatal clinics. The only people who are tested for HIV, generally, in South Africa, as in most of Africa, are pregnant women, pregnant African women. And it needs to be pointed out, as I think others will point out in this seminar later on when they get more into the biology of this, that being pregnant, and especially if you are pregnant for the second time or more, is a condition that will generate what's called cross-reactivity and a false positive result. So if you're looking for probably the least reliable group to test for reliable numbers on HIV, you couldn't do better than pregnant women, and those are the ones that are largely tested, and from pregnant women are extrapolated numbers to include non-pregnant women, non-pregnant white women, pregnant white women, and men. And that's how the statistics are arrived at officially um, in South Africa. Another thing that I think is important to keep in mind when looking, for example, at uh, South Africa is to recall, and here I want to show you as a little example of, of South Africa, uh, something about numbers. I don't know how much South African history um, people here might know, but uh, in South Africa up until uh, 19, 1990, uh, South Africa was territorially divided. It was the official government policy from 1948 onwards of apartheid. Um, South Africa was the last official white supremacy government in the world and was, you know, the skunk and the polecat of the world and so forth. And then suddenly in the early 90s, rather peacefully and to defy all predictions of a, of a, of a nasty race war, 
Um, in, instead, uh, the white supremacists handed over power to Africans. Nelson Mandela was released from jail, and he was elected the first uh, uh, president of, of a multiracial South Africa in 1994. Now, the reason I mention this is that if you looked at a map of South Africa, and this was a map of official South Africa in 1989, for example, here's what you will notice. You will notice that every place where it's sort of white, that is actually the Republic of South Africa. These areas here constitute about 13, 14 percent of the land of South Africa, and under the scheme of apartheid, they were to be ethnic homelands for ethnic speaking people only. Uh, they were very often called the, the TBVC countries. That was just a shorthand for the uh, Transkai, Baputatswana, Venda, and Siskai. But, for example, Baputatswana, these fragmented uh, semi-desert areas all broken apart here, they were for the Tswana-speaking people. Venda, only the Venda people would live there. KwaZulu, which is over here, this is Zulu land, only Zulu would live there. Transkai, this would be for the uh, Kosa, click-speaking people over here in this area. These were not parts of South Africa. This was the Republic of the Transkai. This was KwaZulu. This was Baputatswana. Why do I mention this? I mention that because these boundaries are gone now. In 1994, these boundaries were eliminated. There is no more Baputatswana or Siskai or Transkai or Apartheid. So it's very interesting when you look at numbers in South Africa to ask yourself, when are we talking about these numbers? Because South Africa in 1999 is different than South Africa in 1989. What would you think would happen if I told you that under the policy of apartheid, these rural areas which exclude the major ports of Cape Town, Durban, East London, Port Elizabeth, the gold veins, the gold reefs here of Johannesburg and Pretoria, the diamond mines of Kimberley, these are poor cesspools of poverty, ignorance, disease, upper respiratory illnesses, malnutrition, unclean drinking water. What do you think would happen if I suddenly included the 15 million Africans that lived in those areas and put them in new statistics and said, AIDS is everywhere in South Africa? And that's exactly what happened. And here's a headline, for example. Young, gifted, and dead. This was published in the Sunday Times of Johannesburg, 9th of July, 2000, just before the International AIDS Conference convened in South Africa at, at that time. Now, what I did, because I'm a historian, was I looked at these numbers. Notice, 1990 versus 1999, keeping in mind the little piece of history I just told you. What I did was go and add these numbers up, just set, and I rounded up high. And here are the number of official South African deaths in 1999. All causes, men, 175,000, women, 162,000, 337,000 deaths, officially, according to that Department of uh, Public Affairs, I believe it is, Department of Home Affairs, that's that, those numbers written down this way. Check them out if you like. Population of South Africa, 42 million. That corresponds to a death rate of eight-tenths of one percent. That's the death rate of the United States. Our death rate is eight-tenths of one percent. And so I inquired of people, I said, well, I don't get it. I mean, first of all, you've obliterated the definition of South Africa, but secondly, the death rate here in South Africa, magically, within five years of the ending of apartheid, has achieved that of the United States. I said, you people are to be congratulated for this. So in other words, part of my whole approach was to try and demystify and debunk and calm down this kind of hysteria that there is an AIDS apocalypse, there's an AIDS holocaust, there's an AIDS genocide, there's an AIDS uh, Dante's Inferno sweeping across Africa. I've often wondered what actually is going on in Africa over the last, say, 20 or 23 years. And what's missing from most of the discussions about what's making Africans sick is any discussion about what has happened to most of the African economies, each one of which has its own national history, over the last 23 or 24 years. And I can tell you what's happened in Africa over the last 23 or 24 years, 
And I can be specific about Somalia or specific about Uganda or Rwanda or Congo or South Africa. And that is, over the last 23, 24 years, state structures in Africa have ground down to a halt in many areas. Most states find themselves heavily indebted to international banking institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. They have found that the price for most raw materials and commodities and minerals and agricultural produce has dropped over the last 25 years. Many countries have been visited by an endless chain of civil violence, of military repression. And in fact, public health facilities have become more decrepit than they were maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Vaccinations against measles have declined. The rates of tuberculosis, of malaria, of malnutrition, of unclean drinking water and all kinds of other waterborne bacteria has increased. So if you ask me, are Africans sicker today than they were 15 or 20 years ago? My answer is going to be they probably are. Are they dying of AIDS? Of course not. They are dying of the old, common, widespread afflictions of poverty that are widespread on this particular continent. But if you take this very elastic and very loose definition of an AIDS case, and you apply it to the African continent, and you fail to make any distinction between tuberculosis, malnutrition, uh, malaria, uh, upper respiratory illnesses, childhood diarrhea, and you say that that's AIDS, then I'm going to tell you that if you exclude Africans who die from a gunshot wound in war to a head, and you can confirm that was the cause of death, or Africans who died as a result of an automobile accident where they were run over by a car or a truck in a highway accident, if you exclude Africans who died from a gunshot wound and Africans who died from a road accident, if you said all the other people who die in Africa die of an AIDS-related cause, given the definition of AIDS, you'd probably capture everybody. And that would mean that the numbers are probably too low in that sense. So why has all of this been the way to explain things in Africa? What happened to political economy? What, what happened to good record keeping? What happened to good medical diagnostics where the, pa where the doctor or the nurse or the health practitioner says to the patient, what's wrong? And, and the patient explains, and the doctor listens, and the doctor looks, and the doctor examines, and the doctor thinks carefully, and the doctor treats the patient. If the patient is suffering from diarrhea, you treat the diarrhea. If the patient is suffering from a fever or from a persistent cough, you treat that. But if you tell a patient you have AIDS, given what most of you have grown up with, in fact, or most of us have heard over the last 20 years, believe me, that is going to have in and of itself an immunosuppressive effect on the patient. So a lot of people, in fact, have been given, in my estimation, an absolutely preposterous and misleading definition and diagnosis of what they are suffering from. But I think it's important to understand that something got off the rails from the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And the AIDS epidemic was born in California. It was born in Los Angeles in June of 1981. And it has been assumed from 1981 to this very moment that these cases of AIDS, are ca certainly by 1984, are caused by a virus. And the virus is communicable. It's transmissible. One person gives it to another person. And the easiest mode of doing that is through sexual contact. Th that's the mantra. That's the sacred icon of AIDS. AIDS is caused by HIV. In Africa, however, unlike California or unlike San Francisco, where the bulk of the AIDS cases are found uh, among uh, either drug users or, um, or as a result of homosexual contact. Here are the numbers, for example. These are the San Francisco numbers as of September of 2003. 28,000 cases reported uh, in San Francisco in 23 years. 
and the total number of heterosexual contacts, 1.4, 1.4%. And notice here, there's a two next to this, next to heterosexual contact male, heterosexual contact female. I, I don't mean to be smart alecky here, but the bulk of the people that live in San Francisco are heterosexuals, not homosexuals at all. And a lot of people in San Francisco, in fact, engage in all kinds of risky sexual activities, not just gays. How come it's so small? Very, very tiny. But notice it's even smaller if you look at this qualifying number two, which I've highlighted down here. Heterosexual male, heterosexual female includes persons who have had heterosexual contact with a person with AIDS or with a person who is at risk for HIV. In other words, if you have sex with someone who doesn't have AIDS and doesn't have HIV but could be at risk for it, we put you in this category here, which probably makes this category even larger, I'm sure it is, than it actually even deserves to be. However, in Africa, it is not considered a matter of homosexual transmission of the AIDS virus. It is said to be heterosexual. And as a result, because so many people in the AIDS industry are convinced that controlling sexuality and changing people's sexual behavior will in fact er eradicate the HIV and thereby eliminate AIDS, a huge amount of money has been thrown into Africa for what's very often known as the ABC program. I, I, it's ABCD program. A, ABC. The ABC of eliminating AIDS is real simple. A, abstinence. B, behavior modification. C, condoms. D is drugs. Nowhere in this little hypothesis do any of the questions about the political economy of poverty or the, or the, the inability of people to feed themselves or the lack of proper medical care for basic illnesses get included. There's been this huge campaign to alter the behavior patterns of Africans, thinking, in fact, that it's individual behavior rather than these larger kinds of institutional forces that are actually driving the case that's making Africans, uh, making Africans sick. So I suggest that when we look at AIDS in Africa, we think twice. Think twice about where do these numbers come from? 10 million AIDS orphans. Ask yourself, what's an orphan, according to these people? In our culture, an orphan is a person that has lost both of their parents. Both parents are dead. That's an orphan. Huh? Among AIDS people, when they count orphans in Africa, an orphan can be a person that has lost both of their parents. It can be a person who has lost one or both of his parents. An orphan can be a person who has lost one or both of his parents or one or both of his parents suffer from an AIDS-related illness. That's incredibly broad and vague. I said one time, uh, rather facetiously at an AIDS conference, I said, you know, having traveled a lot in rural Africa, I said to some people, an AIDS orphan is any little African kid, boy or girl, walking barefoot along a village path with a runny nose and no adult supervision, AIDS orphan. And some people would say, what's so funny about that? I'd say, because it's a tragedy, because you're terrorizing and traumatizing a continent, because you really do believe that sex and sexual misconduct is driving this epidemic in Africa, and I'm here to tell you that I think they better think twice. So I will sort of wrap up here. Um, I'm not uh, denying that people are ill or people are sick or dying in Africa. I think we need to be clear on the causes of death. We need to be very clear on the theories about the causes of death. We need to understand, for example, that autopsies are rarely, if ever, done in Africa. A term of art is called an a verbal autopsy, where you ask people, what did uh, Windy Pemby die of here in upcountry Tanzania? And uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, well, he had, a, he had fever and a cough and uh, diarrhea, and he got real thin, and he was a truck driver, and he fooled around with prostitutes. Okay, well, that would be AIDS. So the record keeping is certainly open and very suspect in Africa. Um, also, I think that the intervention techniques and the thoughts that are being done in Africa come classically out of uh, 
the West, and I think they are entirely inappropriate, which is one reason why they have been such an astounding failure in case after case. In my opinion, we will never cure AIDS in Africa until we first cure the research. And I also think that the cure for AIDS is as near at hand as a simple alternative hypothesis as to what is making Africans sick in the first place. Thank you. Here's how I go about answering that question, um, the second part in particular. I think that if we go back and, and I, instead of using the word AIDS, I were to say, do I think that high fevers and persistent coughs and diarrhea and ser serious body loss is a major problem in Africa? I would say absolutely yes. Okay? But I would then quickly add that those symptoms, which have been now called AIDS, are actually the symptoms that are very widespread, very common, uh, hardly rare, and are associated with any number of indicators that go on some kind of misery index in terms of inadequate food, uh, failure to get uh, proper clean drinking water, uh, removal of uh, debris and waste in, in, in areas, the absence of, of uh, you know, some basic medical attention for those kinds of illnesses. To that extent, I'd say yes, there's a lot of sickness and that's what people are suffering from. Is it sexually transmitted? I don't believe any of those symptoms are sexually transmitted. In fact, I know they're not. So I'm not denying, if we want to call that AIDS, then I guess I'll have to say, yeah, then a lot of people are still suffering from AIDS. But it's the definition itself, which I think is very suspect and needs to be critically examined as we do in academia. Say something about your school that you told us about last night when you talked to the principal of the school. Oh, yes. Um, I, I, I went, um, in 1999, I was traveling around uh, Zululand, and I was right, well, I mean, here it is. Uh, here, here's Peter Maritzburg, and I traveled out of Peter Maritzburg right into this area here, which is near Ulundi. Ulundi was the traditional Zulu capital, and it was the capital of, of KwaZulu, this Spanish <coughs> dam. And I was in a rural area and pulled up to a small school. And it was December, so it was summertime down there, and they were all out of school. And um, it was very kind of tuse, you know, rectangular buildings. I, if people stay on later, I can show these slides and, and of, of that school. And um, the principal came out to greet me, a big, big strong, stout uh, uh, Zulu woman, said her name was Beauty Nongila. She wanted to know what I was up to, and I told her I was a teacher from California, and I just wanted to see a school. And you know, all, this whole area was just plastered with AIDS posters and AIDS warnings. And here I was at this elementary school, primary school, and uh, 450 students crammed into little desks, uh, 10 teachers, for example. Um, kids generally walked a mile and a half to two miles in each direction to come to school. And Zululand gets chilly, believe me, in June, July, and August, even though it's Southern Hemisphere, it's nippy down there and hot in the summertime. I looked at this beauty after a half hour, 45 minutes, and I said, you know, beauty, if there is one thing that you need more in this school, what is it? And, and as soon as I got the question out of my mouth, she said, more toilets. And she pointed, and I've got the slide on this, not that photographs of toilets is such a big deal, but that's what she pointed to. This little outhouse with four little doors. She said, I got four toilets for 450 students. Most of them are malnourished. All of them have some kind of respiratory illness. And she said, you imagine what a, what a, what a fuss this is trying to keep them in order and teach something when they all want to be scrambling out to the toilet to go to the bathroom there. She said, that's what I need. There was not a word at all about anything to do with AIDS, and I found that to be the case true when I visited hospitals in uh, central Ethiopia, and northern Somalia in 2001, and then in Zululand again in, um, in, in 2001, 2000, I mean, sorry, I was up in this very remote area, 
It's called Maputa land. It's between Zululand and the southern area of, of uh, Mozambique, up here, and went to a hospital, Mussolini Hospital. And there I simply asked people, you know, how many patients are here? And they told me. And I said, you know, what are the wards? And they said, well, there's 470 patients. We've got five wards. And this is OBGYN. This is pediatric problems. Uh, over here, we got tuberculosis. Uh, the fourth ward is for um, uh, gunshot wounds and accidents and that, that kind of stuff. And this one here is for uh, uh, people that are uh, not mentally stable. And I went over that again. I didn't ask where was the AIDS ward. There wasn't an AIDS ward. There, was the, there were the five wards that you would expect to find in an extremely impoverished area. So very often, if you're doing research on this topic in Africa, I find that it's what people don't tell you that's obviously very, very interesting. Sure. What is the Bush administration think about the story? And uh, I'm not, I think that we're sending some money to Africa. I'm not sure I heard that a couple months ago. And um, where, where are we funding with this? That's a, that's a very, very good question. I, I can't tell you exactly what the Bush administration thinks about this theory except that I know that they don't accept it. I've read what Colin Powell, who's not an AIDS expert, has said, and he's just basically repeated the party line, which is that uh, AIDS is caused by reckless uh, behavior, very often caused by soldiers out of control, and therefore militarily unstable countries need to be given aid in order to stabilize the military, for example, so they're not rapacious and sexual predators, I mean, that kind of argument. Um, a, a lot of money has been promised to Africa and was included in the um, State of the Union address and a figure has been bandied around of $15 billion, which is pretty serious. We, we spend in this country year after year, although the AIDS numbers continue to drop, you should know we spend about $14 billion a year on AIDS research, AIDS medicines, AIDS education and so forth. But the $15 billion is supposed to be spread out over a five-year period and it's been sort of wrapped together with HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. And it's hard for me to figure out which money goes for TB and which goes for malaria and which goes for HIV and AIDS. Even after you make that distinction, my guess is going to be that the HIV and AIDS money is going to go either for, you know, uh, a chicken in every pot and a condom in every bathroom and uh, some of these drugs which are said to be such life-healing drugs. Now, later in this series, you're going to be able to talk to a chemist and biologists that have actually designed those drugs, and they can tell you a lot more about the chemistry of so-called antiretroviral drugs or AIDS drugs than, than I can. But I suspect some of that will be used to subsidize and make very cheap uh, some of those drugs as well. Sure. Why was the history of the definition of AIDS developed? How or why? Yeah, what is the history of how did this come about? <laughs> well, um, th there actually is a book about this, and the stuff's buried in the middle of it. It's called um, uh, uh, Level 4, The Virus Hunters of the CDC, uh, by a couple that were involved in organizing a conference in uh, Central African Republic, which is a country north of Congo, north of Zaire, a French, ex-French colony. And the World Health Organization organized a conference in October of 1985 in Bangui. And this was a year, oh, 18, 15 months after a press conference in Washington in April of 84, where it was announced that HIV was the cause of AIDS. Okay? So 15 months later, the WHO convenes a conference in Bangui and they admit that they don't do any testing for HIV particles or HIV antibodies in Africa. And since they don't do any testing, and since they don't think that homosexuality is a big problem in Africa, like it was or supposed to be with AIDS cases in the United States, they need to come up with a clinical symptoms definition. And that's exactly what they came up with, and all parties present agreed to that. And from that day to this, that is the definition of an AIDS case in Africa. I think in 1993, tuberculosis was added. You know, the, the sputum from, from the tubercular bacillus was added to the list of the five, uh, of four. And it stayed that way. 
that's what they're counting. And it's from a WHO conference in 1985. It's gone unchanged in 19 years. That's the history of it. it as we say, you can, you can look it up. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. If you had plots of just overall death rate as a function of time for certain of these epicenters of AIDS, what would it look like in the last 20 years? Has there been any raise in overall death rate that I, may be being attributed to AIDS or for whatever reason, or, or are they flat? Maybe start with something about the quality of, of uh, public health statistics in the various countries. Yeah. There's something called the Global Burden of Disease Study, which is a WHO Harvard Medical School venture. Five volumes, each one's about 1,200 pages. In the Global Burden of Disease Study, they admit that vital statistics for Africa are the weakest and the poorest of any of the eight regions of the world that they use. They claimed in 1996 that vital statistics for mortality were available for only 1.1% of all deaths in Africa. 1.1%. And I would bet the vast majority of those came from South Africa, where record keeping was, was pretty good. So I can tell you from my work in Somalia and in Uganda and Djibouti that these are very, very difficult numbers to come by. Okay, that's the first point. So we're talking about some guesses. However, it's, South Africa is extremely interesting because, for example, here's a book by Francis Wilson and Manfela Rampele called Uprooting Poverty, the South African Challenge. It's published in 1989. Now, if you go and read this, which was a classic study in 1989, go and read this book, you'll see it's, a, it's about life in these areas, in these Bantu stands. And you'll see what the you know, uh, maternal death rate is, what, uh, you know, Childhood deaths under the age of five are, for example. And there's nothing very astounding about anything they say there. I mean, it's gripping reading, it's very annoying, it, it's an angering thing, it mobilizes against a white supremacist government that allowed this sort of thing to go on. But if you were to take the word um, uh, poverty or underdevelopment or impoverishment, and every time you saw it in there, you replaced it with HIV AIDS, you have pretty much a study of South Africa in 2003 or 2004. So I've looked for those numbers, and I haven't been able to find them. I asked, for example, when looking at these numbers, you know, the, these the young, gifted, and dead numbers, uh, sorry, um, one of the things I wanted to know was um, if they could break down these uh, 1999 figures by province. There's nine provinces in South Africa. I said, uh, you know, um, could you break these down for the Eastern Cape province? And I'd like to see Gauteng, that's the province around Johannesburg, and KwaZulu-Natal. Could you break those down for me by province? And if you broke them down by province, by gender, and by race. Because otherwise, how'd you get these numbers? And they said, well, those numbers don't exist. I said, well, how do these numbers exist? And they said, well, look, we need to move along here now. So, I mean, there's a, the, the, it's like a dentist drilling on a patient without Novocaine. The closer you get to the nerve, you know, the more jumpy and anxious the people get. So, when you start to look for these numbers, I, I, I would welcome your assistance in it. I've tried to find them myself, and I can't find them. So, they're rounded up generally, bigger, more ominous, the better. It, it, one last thing, I'm going to say that if, if you look, for example, at a particular country, say Uganda, and, which was considered one of the census rates. If you looked at Uganda and you looked at death rates and mortality in Uganda in the 60s, you would find that actually the public health system was pretty good in Uganda. Then you looked at it in the 70s, you would have to see that the health system collapsed and deaths from measles and malnutrition and uh, civil violence and a whole host of other you know, maladies increased. Was it because of people's sexual behavior? No, it was because of the homicidal jackal that was running the country, Idi Amin. Once he left, and he was thrown out of office and overturned in 79, you begin to see that things improved in Uganda beginning once stabilization happened in 87 or 88. Because food prices improved, uh, uh, civil servants returned to Uganda, 
The government was able to attract uh, international loans. The Indian population that had been expelled slowly came back, and the country gradually recovered. That's what you would see there. You looked at Somalia, you'd see what would happen once the government collapsed in 1991. It was death by starvation and mortality rates shot up tremendously. Once that got stabilized, the death rates have gone down again. Now, there isn't anything very sensational about this, but it's just to try to say maybe there's a different way of looking at all of this, which demystifies um, this kind of hysteria, which, which dominates the media so much. Yeah. Uh, according to the symptoms that you mentioned a few minutes ago in the case definition, there certainly does seem to be a lot of overlap between TB and, uh, and AIDS, for example. Have you had a chance to talk to any physicians there on the beat there in Africa? Do they, do they suspect that a lot of the cases that are really attributed to AIDS are actually TB? Or? Some will say that, exactly. Some are very careful and very cautious. Is this, is this a political hot potato for them? Of course it's not. They can't tell anybody what they're thinking? That's, a that, certainly is, that certainly is part of it. When, when, when you go back and look at how cash-starved many of these governments are, particularly the Ministry of Health, and you then see that there are billions of dollars, perhaps, in the offing for HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, if I'm a doctor, Probably, I would say something like, and this is what appears in the medical literature, uh, people who are HIV positive uh, have a great tendency to uh, develop tuberculosis. And my argument would be treat the tuberculosis, a six-month regimen of drugs against tuberculosis, the supervised swallowing, watching the patient take those pills, is extremely effective and costs about 25 bucks. Leave out the HIV out of the, uh, out of the hypothesis and treat the tuberculosis, absolutely. So I think there is a lot of running together of symptoms and calling it something else. A question there and then got here. Well, my question is, let's assume, I know this is kind of vague, but there is actually a disease called AIDS, and I think it's defined by, by American standards. And you told us that there's a kind of a sketchy definition in Africa and institutional problems and uh, disease, and it may not be what, what it seems. And granted, what can you tell us as an expert of AIDS about the AIDS? You know, like, as we in San Francisco or America find what is it, what is happening in AIDS? You've been telling us what's not happening. You know, what's happening? Is it, is it a problem over there? What do we know? Now, are we talking about the problem over there or over here? Yeah. Oh, in Africa. Well, that's sort of like the question he was asking me, and I, 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 my answer, I guess, has got to be the same. Well, go ahead, go ahead. Well, my question is, what do we know? You told, me, you told us the answer that you told us was that if you want to call AIDS, dying, coughing, and vomiting, uh, and losing your weight, and that, then that's okay. But what exactly can we say about AIDS as we know it here in America? Do we know anything as far as Africa? Well, I'll tell you this. AIDS as we know it in America is defined decisively differently than AIDS in Africa. What I just uh, mentioned as the four clinical symptoms of an AIDS case in Africa, which is what I'm telling you it's not, if you look at America, which is after all where most of this research is generated from, the early AIDS cases or it was called Gay-Related Infectious Disease Syndrome, then it was changed to AIDS in, in, in 1982, that has come to include 29 different opportunistic infections, like pneumocystocarine pneumonia, or Kaposi sarcoma, or salmonella, or cervical dysplasia. All of those are separate diseases. All 29 are called AIDS indicator diseases in the United States. There's also a CD4 cell count. Okay, and an HIV positive test result, whether it's ELISA generally or Western blot. So the definition of an AIDS case in the United States is decisively different than an AIDS case in Africa. That we definitely know. What I was trying to suggest is why is that the case? Because that comes back to the Bangui definition. So that's what we know. Now here's something else, just let me as a follow up on this. Tell me what you think about this, uh, if I can find it. Um, hmm. Let's see, I have, oh, we can hear it is. Tell me what you think about this. These are a little bit out of date, okay? Um, 
here I've got the entire state of California, 34 million people. The cumulative number of AIDS cases reported over 19 years is 120,000. Over 19 years, AIDS cases reported. According to the CDC definition, of that number, 5,400, or 4.6, were said to be heterosexual. And among the heterosexual risk cases, males were 30%. In other words, this is the total number of heterosexual AIDS cases over 20 years, and that's about 275 AIDS cases among heterosexuals in California a year. Okay, that, that's the number. Here at San Mateo County, I, I could have done Napa, but I, I, this was, so I got my county here. Here's San Mateo, uh, population 722,000, cumulative number of AIDS cases is 1,800, and as of October 2000, cumulative number of heterosexual AIDS cases is 113. 21 males, 92 females, 6% of the total, six per year. Six heterosexual AIDS cases in San Mateo County, which includes Stanford, I think, is right there. Stanford students have parties on the weekend. How do you explain that? Or Santa Clara, 10, or Butte County, which contains my university, America's former number one party school, Chico <laughs> State. <laughs> Population of 220,000, cumulative number of AIDS cases were there, over 18 years, 202, 11 per year. And I said, please feel free to interpret this data. Who would like to have a go with this? Tell me what's going on here. I mean, I have my own explanation, but oops, time is out. It's